The story of the brothers Gibb is a roller coaster ride of triumph and tragedy, setbacks and comebacks. And during a career that has spanned more than 40 years, they've repeatedly shown a unique ability to reinvent their sound and reconnect with audiences around the world. Their remarkable journey begins in 1944 in Manchester, England, with the marriage of drummer and bandleader Hugh Gibb to Barbara Pass. The next year, the Gibbs welcomed a baby girl, Leslie, and settled off the coast of Great Britain on the Isle of Man. On September 1st, 1946, Barry, the first Bee Gee, was born. At 18 months, he accidentally overturned a tea kettle on himself and was so badly scalded, he nearly died. He was in hospital for three months. He was very, very ill. He never spoke till he was three years old. And, and I think that when those things happen to you in life, what you gain from it is, is incredible inner strength. It did make him stronger, more determined. I think that's what really helped us, you know, to make the pattern for his life. The Gibb family welcomed two more sons on December 22, 1949, when twins Robin and Morris were born. They were neither identical in appearance nor disposition. They've all always had distinctive personalities. Morris was always very friendly, everybody's mate. Robin's always been a little bit withdrawn and into himself, but when they were together, they were the same. I was Mr. Goody Goody. Uh, I was I was so scared doing anything wrong. I'm basically a very shy person. I have to really know somebody before I reveal myself, uh, literally. I like being spontaneous. I like being funny with people. I like being relaxed, but you won't get that right away with me. Robin always had the twinkle in his eye. And of course, I think Morris did too. Don't forget they're twins, you know? So there was a specific, special way that they would play off each other that only twins would know. Rowan and I were not identical. We we're fraternal twins, and but we had the same sense of humor. We had the same love of the same kind of music. Being a twin, uh, I don't think it's so much having much to do with the Bee Gees. I think we would have been the Bee Gees if it had, even if we hadn't been twins. I never thought of me and Morris as separate from Barry. I always saw the three of us as three equal brothers. By 1955, Hugh's band had broken up. So in search of new opportunities, he moved the family back to Manchester. In the glory days of the empire, Manchester was the world's cotton capital, one of the great industrial centers. Now it was a working class city in decline. So too were the Gibb family fortunes. To support Barbara and the four kids, Hugh held down two jobs. The house was always filled with music. The brothers were influenced by the Mills brothers and the Everly brothers. By the time Barry was nine and the twins were six, they were already singing in three-part harmony. There was quite a number of times when my parents and my sister would come in the room and wonder if the radio was on when we were doing that early stuff. Lollipop was one of the songs he used to sing, remember? Lollipop, <laughs> Robin and I seem to have evolved into two different leads, and Morris is an expert harmonist, is that the right word? But he would always know where to put that other melody. Make, make that to make a three-part harmony. When Barry was nine and the twins, Maurice and Robin, were six, they formed a band called the Rattlesnakes. The Bee Gees' musical career actually began at the movies. One day before the feature, a boy got up on stage and mimed to an Elvis Presley record. The brothers were inspired to try it themselves. So we got the guitar and the records that we intended to mime to, and uh, on the way to the Gormont, theater, we were running, and Morris dropped the records. In those days, they broke, folks. We were very disappointed that we'd lost our chance, and, but we persuaded the manager to allow us to go on and sing anyway. And we just did what we did at home. And the kids loved it, and I, God, I remember that feeling. It was great. And we had our first real audience rush, you know? And 
wow, this is what we want to do. Walking down the street in Manchester, I remember Barry saying that one day we're going to be really famous. And we said, oh, yeah, yeah. whatever you say. He's the big brother, you know. <laughs> As pint-sized rock and rollers, Barry, Robin, and Morris performed frequently at local theaters. To adults in the 1950s, rock and roll was synonymous with trouble. And so were the brothers Gibb. I and Robin were terrorists. I mean, nothing stopped in their way. Now when I think back, I feel really bad for my parents. Because if I'd have been my parents, I would have been pulling my hair out. You know? And my father had little enough as it was. <laughs> Robin, especially, was very naughty. He used to light fires all over the place. Oh, yeah. You mean the flame? <laughs> to set hedges on fire. He'd light fires under the bed. Yeah, I was a bit of a firebug when I was young. Barry and Robin were constantly getting into trouble. Local authorities confronted Hugh and Barbara, suggesting that if they didn't want to see their boys end up in reform school, they might want to consider emigrating. At the same time, there was a new arrival in the Gibb household, Andy, born in March of 1958. Shortly afterwards, the family decided to make a fresh start. I'd never heard of Australia, just a strange word to me, Australia, I'm sort of Australia. Oh, m amazing, adventure. Because uh, that, that was what was in our spirit. Uh, that, that's why we were always getting into mischief. The idea of what's around the corner really was inside us. So the idea of going to Australia we didn't even know what that was, but sounds good. Let's try it. The Gibbs settled in Queensland, a state in northeast Australia known for its sunshine, beautiful beaches, and the Great Barrier Reef. Hugh took a job as a photographer. He bought an 8mm camera, and the brothers immediately began making home movies. I was filming them. <laughs> I was always the guy behind the camera, because I've always been the technical one. There. Barry and Robin, I wouldn't go as far as to say that their videotape, which players are still flashing 12, but it's <laughs> We'd film home movies of fights and things and people like hostage taking or, you know, people blowing up the tower, you know. We used to just come up with some daft stuff. In Australia, the brothers continued their quest for fame. To achieve that goal, they would sing just about anywhere. We always looked for the best toilets in town. We'd go and sing in there because of the echo. And there was a great one I remember in, in Pitt Street, Sydney. It, no, it was in the park, and it was a great echo. Really long, and, and it was, we, we sang these harmonies, they sounded like records. The brothers took their act to a local speedway where they sang between races. The crowd showed their appreciation by throwing coins. Bill Gates, a local disc jockey, was impressed and persuaded Hugh and Barbara to let him promote the boys. As the initials BG were everywhere, Bill Gates, Barbara Gibb, Barry Gibb, Brothers Gibb, it was suggested the trio be called the Bee Gees. Soon the boys were heard regularly on Gates's radio show. In the summer of 1960, the Bee Gees got their next big break. The Bee Gees, Barry A, the leader of the group, come here. Barry Gibb and your, and your young brothers. Now, come on, who are you? Which is which? Your twins, eh? I'm Robin. Robin? And Morris. And Morris. Yes. Now, you all seem together, eh? That's right. And your brother, Barry, plays. Now, come on up. Come on up here. Yeah. This was the first of what would be many TV appearances over the next few years. Bee Gees also played clubs and county fairs where they honed their craft as performers. With the act still in its formative stages, show business veteran Hugh became their manager. My father, bless him, has been unbelievable in our lives. He, he has been the main instigator of everything that we learned about the stage. Oh, my old man, the dustman, he wears the dustman's hat. He wears blimey trousers and he lives in a council. Even down to little things like when you go on, smile, because if you look like crap and you feel like crap, so will the audience. Smile, they'll smile with you. He taught us professionalism. I said, no, I ain't gone, Dad. You're getting past your prime. And I was doing the clothes, which to make all the, the little waistcoats. And we cut an old pair of evening shoes up to make BG and gold leather on the 
That's it. Little things, you know. In 1963, their dream of becoming stars took a giant leap forward. They signed a record contract. What made the Bee Gees unique at this young age was that they weren't just singers, they also wrote songs. And their very first release was a Barry Gibb original. Kiss me once, oh yeah, baby. Kiss me twice, oh yeah, crazy. Kiss me three times, the three kisses of love. quite a few of our own songs and couldn't get a hit. We tried singing a couple of other people's songs and we still didn't get a hit. So we thought, well, we'll just go back to singing our own songs because, you know, if we have flops, at least there are flops. Tell me that you really care I Run your fingers through my hair Kiss me once, kiss me twice And I'm in paradise at this point, the brothers were supporting the family as professional entertainers, singing adult songs to adults. But their music and their ambitions were instantly transformed in 1964, when Australia, like the rest of the world, was invaded by the British. When the Beatles came to Sydney, the magic was unbelievable. I was mesmerized by them, because they were doing something that we loved to do. And they were successful at it. I loved it because it was so, these were, this was a group, and they were singing um, three-part harmony. And they were singing it like we did. I will find, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? No one seemed very interested in us, the record company, nobody. We were doing television shows, but we were just regular TV acts. We weren't people having hit records, you know? And that was our dream. And at that point in time, our dream was being blocked. I was totally convinced that the right thing we had for us to do was to leave Australia. We knew if we were gonna make it, Big international, we had to leave Australia and go to London. Right up, chap. Let's have a check. Black? Check. Check. Right up. Right. Right. On PM, Boris. Okay. 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 Right. Just before leaving the country, the Bee Gees recorded one last song, Spicks and Specks. Oh, where is the sun that shone on my head? The Bee Gees made a lasting impression on their youngest brother, Andy. Andy would watch his brothers perform from backstage, marveling at what he saw. Andy dreamed of being a performer, too. And it was his older brother, Barry, who encouraged Andy's love of music. Barry bought Andy his first guitar at age nine. He used to stand in the middle of them when they were rehearsing. Make them really mad, you know, <laughs> you move him. You know? But uh, yes, he always liked to be where they were, singing with them. Andy was very much, uh... Uh, emulated Barry a lot, you know, and he, he thought a great deal of his older brother, you know, so it was, he had a, a, a sort of a hero worship for him. In January 1967, the entire Gibb family boarded a ship that would take them back home to England. While at sea, they received unexpected news. Spicks and Specks had gone to number one in Australia. But there was no turning back. The Bee Gees were sailing into unknown and possibly treacherous waters. In February of 1967, when the Bee Gees arrived in England, the music scene was still dominated by the Beatles, in whose wake had come the Rolling Stones, the Who, and many other successful groups. The Bee Gees were determined to be the next big thing, but their optimism was immediately challenged by a random encounter with another group. When we got off the ship, there were these four guys standing on the dock. It was nighttime, and it was thick fog. And, the four, uh, and these four guys were dressed exactly as the Beatles were dressed in hell. They, they said they were a group, a failed group, and said, groups are out, it's over. And they said, you know, go back, go back. And we'd go back where? It took us five weeks to get here, you know. Once again, it's like the resilience thing. It didn't matter what came our way. It was, it was just another obstacle. Get out of the way. We're going to make it. We're going to be famous. The Bee Gees returned to England from Australia with the dream of becoming British pop stars. 
Before leaving Australia, the Bee Gees had mailed demo tapes to prospective record companies, agents and managers in London. Nobody was interested, except for Robert Stigwood, who at the time was partnered with the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. Stigwood liked what he heard and summoned them to an audition. Rob came in his coat, looking a bit like Oscar Wilde. You know? I've always felt this day he was a little the worse for wear when he came down. But I'm being kind, Robert. <laughs> they claim I fell asleep, which is rubbish. And we did our club act <laughs> from a, even a Peter, Paul and Mary section we do. We did about four or five songs and, uh, and he had two people next to him and then he got up and he nodded to them and they all walked out. And that was it. And uh, they came home and they were really heartbroken. They said it was just a waste of time. The Bee Gees believed that Stigwood had not really heard them. They were wrong. That night, he called to offer the brothers a five-year contract. My gut instinct told me that they would be sensational because uh, you can't deny talent. And the talent was so obvious. The link between Bob Stigwood and the Bee Gees was very close, and the relationship was just like that of Brian Epstein and the Beatles. For Bob Stigwood, the Bee Gees were his boys and it was like a family almost. And the thing is, Robert loved them and he believed in them. Sometimes a bit of a complex relationship, but it certainly worked. He opened up the world to the Bee Gees very, very quickly. And I don't think at that particular time, anyone else could have done that, jo that job. And uh, what we're, what's happening to us today is because of what he did then. Within months, their new manager, Robert Stigwood, was making it happen. It was all like a fantasy come true. The place that we'd left earlier was suddenly the place where we wanted to be, you know, professionally. The first thing the Bee Gees needed to do was expand from a vocal trio to a proper rock band. They added two Australian musicians, Colin Peterson on drums and Vince Maloney on lead guitar. Robert Stigwood sat there and said, you're going to do it, and I'm going to make sure you do it. And he never, ever made a, a negative comment about whether it might or might not work. This is where we're going, and that's it. In the event of something happening to me, there is something I would like you all to see. It's just a photograph of someone that I knew. Have you seen my wife, Mr. Jones? To augment their sound and make themselves into a real band, the Bee Gees added two musician friends from Australia, Colin Peterson on drums and Vince Maloney on lead guitar. The new group recorded their first single and Stigwood mounted a bold publicity campaign, declaring them the most significant new musical talents of 1967. Whoa. Talking about us? You know, we were like, whoa, I'm Barry, oh my God, that's something to live up to. This is how Stigwood wanted to launch the Bee Gees. And he didn't want to do it half-heartedly. He knew that he wanted to make an impact. And the only way by doing it is actually throwing down the gauntlet. And they were compared with the Beatles right from the word go, which really was a compliment. It's definitely the pressure we needed to inspire us. When New York mining disaster appeared in the spring of 1967, it really cut through almost everything else on the radio like just a beacon through a fog because it was a strong narrative mood building song. It made people realize that there were some really good new storytellers in popular music. In less than six months, the Bee Gees had gone from unknowns at the Southampton docks to having top 20 hits on both sides of the Atlantic they were instantly plunged into the hurricane of first fame. But at that point, just as our heads were about to explode, you know, uh, Robert sat us down and said, now I want you to listen to me. You haven't made it. You've got a hit record. Don't get it all out of proportion. When you've had five hit records, I'll say to you, you've made it. A key element of their success was the emotional depth of their sound. The Bee Gees had always been fans of soul music. Recognizing this, Stigwood arranged a meeting with a legendary soul artist. He introduced me to Otis Redding, and we sat in the suite, 
and we chatted for a while and, and Robert said, I want, I want you to write a song for Otis Redding. And I said, well, we'll certainly try, you know, we'd be delighted because we, I mean, we, were, we were huge fans. And um, to love somebody was born that night. You don't know what it's like. Baby, you don't know what it's like. To love somebody, to love somebody the way I love you. Robert went out that night and he said, I'm leaving you alone tonight. When I come back, I want to hear an Otis Redding song. Oh, thanks, Rob. Yeah. And I was just that I was young enough and ambitious enough that, of course, I'll do it right away, you know. So I sang the body of that song to Robert when he came in. And he said, thank you. That's what I want. And uh, when I got back to England, we finished the song together. Redding died before he could record To Love Somebody. So the brothers cut it themselves, turning it into one of their most beloved songs. I think once Massachusetts became the number one record in England, our first number one record, that was something. You can actually guess how you're going to feel when you get your first number here because it's something you've always wanted to have. It was kind of like a fulfillment of what we wanted to do. We left Australia. This is kind of uh, a confirmation of our belief in ourselves. It's kind of like, yeah, we did the right thing. The I wanna do. What I was so impressed with in terms of the Bee Gees is that the harmonies were incredible, very, very unique, very distinctive. Almost to where the name Bee Gees was the adjective for what they were doing uh, from the minute they appeared on American radio. It's like it sounds like the Bee Gees. I don't know anybody who can sing harmony quite so naturally as they do. Uh, you know, you get them in a room here and ask them to sing, and immediately you're assailed by a perfect harmony. The Bee Gees' singular sound also features the presence of two distinct lead vocal styles. Barry's soulful, passionate delivery, and Robin's ethereal vibrato. I started a joke, which started the whole world crying. He's got a wonderful voice. It, makes, it still makes me go cold when I listen to him. That vibrato was killer, you know, and the more we could use it, the better. It was a vulnerable instrument in a very forceful way because he had no competition whatsoever in pop music. There was no other voice like his. Oh, if I'd only seen that the joke was on me. An undeniable strength of the Bee Gees has always been their songwriting. Like John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the brothers, sometimes working separately, sometimes together, were quickly proving to be prolific composers. Almost every night. I think there's an affinity between the Bee Gees and the Beatles, particularly with their early material, in the linking of very good hooks, very good melodies, which stick in the mind. And that's in itself is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. You had to listen to these songs once they came on. You had to listen to them because they were very, very magnetic and they cast a spell in a way that was very piercing in its personal directness. Smile, an everlasting smile. A smile can bring you near to me. Don't ever let me find you God, because that would bring a tear to me. The Bee Gees' greatest strength had always been their unbreakable family bond. While on the surface everything seemed wonderful, the truth was that success, love, and the trappings of fame were ripping the Bee Gees apart. 
In 16 months, the Bee Gees' lives changed completely. They made three albums and had nine hit singles. They got famous, they got money, they got girls, and they got crazy. I'm getting sick. It was all great, but it was all too much. After the third Bee Gees album was released in the summer of 1968, guitarist Vince Maloney left the band. As the group entered the studio to begin work on their fourth album, tensions rose. As 1969 began, the Bee Gees were riding a two-year tidal wave of success. But deep divisions were emerging between the brothers, threatening everything for which they'd worked so hard. It's very difficult being successful in the rock and roll business. Stems out more difficult to stay successful because the pressures are so great. You're always on demand. You're always at everyone's beck and call. You cannot escape the fame, which is a kind of prison for, for young people. We needed that capacity for separate lives, where not everything was based on what the other did. The tendency always is to say, damn it, I'm a BG. I'd much rather be Barry or I'd much rather be Robin, or, or much rather be Morris. Same with the Beatles, you know. They got sick and tired of being a Beatle. They wanted to be their own people, with their own recognition. Love interests were happening and jealousies were happening. You know, I call it um, just lack of maturity. To me, a lot of what happened in that breakup was due to too much happening too soon. What happened was drugs. Pilly Potty and Pissy, you know, each one did different drugs or whatever, you know. Robin would take a few pills if I smoked a joint or if I had a drink. Mine was booze all the way. We stopped knowing each other. We stopped feeling each other's feelings. And uh, that's another lesson, you know. That, that, that's what drugs do. That's what, uh, that's what drink does. We lost contact with each other. Me, Barry, and Morris didn't really talk as much as we used to, and therefore, we, you know, there was a kind of bickering going on. If Robin said something about me, the same reporter would come to me and say, did you know that Robin said that, and vice versa, you know? I don't think we were mature enough to stop it. I think we enjoyed publicity. So the press would thrive on it, and we thrived on it. There's always been two very forceful personalities, uh in the Bee Gees, and that's Barry Gibb and Robin. Poor old Morris was in the middle. He didn't know what was going on. Yes, it's the story of my life, really. <laughs> Morris found himself on both sides of the escalating battle, torn between the conflicting ambitions of Barry and Robin. And Robin, believing Stigwood was giving Barry more attention, became resentful. With the group about to release their fourth album, the atmosphere surrounding the brothers had become charged with suspicion and distrust. What really happened is 1st of May, the record was coming out, and everybody sort of went for 1st of May as being the A-side, and Barry was singing the lead on that. And on the other side, there was Lamplight, which Robin was singing the lead. And so Robert chose 1st of May, and thinking he was biased towards Barry, Robin said, ah, that's it, I've had it, because he thought it was done on purpose. Robin quit the group and started work on a solo album he became isolated from the family. Disturbed by his erratic behavior, Hugh and Barbara tried to make 19-year-old Robin a ward of the court. It was kind of a whole strange episode of our lives, that particular. It, it didn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense now, but it, it, it happened. And it was kind of a weird feeling all the time it was happening. Robin's very first solo single, Saved by the Bell, rose to number two on the British charts. Barry and Morris, continuing as the Bee Gees, made Don't Forget to Remember, which also went to number two. Tomorrow. Barry, Morris, and Colin continued as the Bee Gees, with Sister Leslie filling in for Robin's vocal at one performance. The scaled-down version of the group appeared in Stigwood's slapstick comedy movie, Cucumber Castle. That was to come. By early 1970, the Bee Gees had stopped working together and embarked on a series of solo projects. I would never have guessed at that point, however, that the Bee Gees would come back together again. It didn't feel like that was ever going to happen again. I knew they would get back together eventually. I mean, blood's thicker than water. They were brothers. The time we spent apart 
was basically a rough time for the three of us emotionally because although we, we separated as a group, I don't think we really mentally wanted to. We miss each other so desperately musically and as brothers, you know, we're brothers. And it couldn't go on, even if we weren't a group anymore, we couldn't go on not speaking to each other all our lives. After months of trying to figure out the best way to breach the gulf between them, the brothers were finally ready to come together as the Bee Gees. It was a little nervous working together again. The first things we cut was uh, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, which was written in the afternoon, and Lonely Days that night, and two number one records, which we had no idea they would be. Lonely days, lonely nights. Where would I be without my woman? Lonely Days was an instrumental I was playing, the opening thing on the piano, and Barry and Robin came around and we started singing it, and before we knew it, the song was taking shape. We were like new, it was like fresh. It was the energy that each one had on expressing what they'd learned by being apart. It all came out in that, in that week. And uh, it was brilliant. It was a wonderful session, wonderful. Lonely days. We came back as men, you said. We'd always been boys growing up together and brothers before. And I think we came back together as three, three guys where we respected each other's space and interests and opinions. If anything, that was the good thing that came out of it. In writing about the problems they faced as brothers, they had created a music that was deeply felt. Singing about separation and reconciliation, about love lost and found, in essence, telling their own story, they reconnected with their audience. I don't think people expected them to come back, uh, either to, to reform or to come back with um, music that was so confident. The brothers Gibb had survived their breakup and made a triumphant return to the top of the charts. There was every reason to expect that their second career would be even more successful than their first. But the Bee Gees were in for a rude awakening. In the early 1970s, the Bee Gees enjoyed a short burst of success. Run To Me was their fourth top 20 hit since they reunited. You run to me. But by mid-1972, their comeback had stalled, and record sales were slowing. The Bee Gees went through a hard stretch at a time when popular music was very transitional and people were looking for something new rather than the tried and true. The Bee Gees were having a very difficult time trying to figure out where to take their uniqueness, how to reinvent themselves, you know, and still stay distinctive. During the early 70s, the music world changed. British pop had faded in favor of the hard rock of Led Zeppelin and The Who, and the Bee Gees' popularity faded with it. As children, the brothers had seen their father's fortune change when big bands went out of fashion. Now it was happening to them. About 1970 to 74, we couldn't, we couldn't sell records to save our lives. I guess what happens is, at the end of every decade, the whole business says, well, everyone in, from the last decade, step over to the left, and everyone, in, everyone that wants to be big in the new decade, come on in. So the business treated us like that. The media in England, sort of on the radio, basically said, well, the Bee Gees are finished, you know. And like a lot of acts like us, it was the end of our period. In search of a more contemporary sound, their manager, Robert Stigwood, paired the Bee Gees with legendary R&B producer, Arif Martin. Oh 
Released in 1974, the Mr. Natural album did not crack the top 100. It was, however, an important transition as it reawakened their passion for soul music. In late 1974, the Bee Gees began performing on the British nightclub circuit. The Gibb family felt the younger brother had the talents to make it big like the Bee Gees. At age 15, with his family's blessing, Andy put everything on the line when he quit school to pursue a career in music. He hoped to break into the business by joining his brother's group. Barry took a special interest in Andy's growth as an artist. He and Andy shared a very unique and close bond. For me, Andy was someone extremely close. In February 1974, at age 16, Andy formed his own band called Melody Fair. The name was taken from a Bee Gees song. Melody Fair quickly exhausted its opportunities on the Isle of Man. In 1975, Barbara decided to take the band to Australia, where the Bee Gees had enjoyed success in the 1960s. While in Australia, being the younger brother of the Bee Gees, Andy drew a lot of attention. He was in constant demand for TV talk shows and other guest appearances. Despite being just 16, Andy understood early on some of the industry pitfalls. Andy imposed strict rules upon the band. No drinking or drugs were tolerated before or after performances. His career was being watched from afar by one of music's most successful moguls, Robert Stigwood the man behind the success of the Bee Gees. Well, if anyone can do it, uh, if anyone can make Andy a star, it's Robert Stigwood. I'd seen him perform in Australia, and I thought he was sensational. What, what did you learn from your brothers? I don't know. It's nothing you could actually say, pinpoint that I learned. It's just a general experience of just handling everything, just being around them. You know, I never really mixed with people my own age. I was always around them in television studios, you know, and just concerts and tours. Andy needed to work his way in and not just go on the coattails of his brothers, which he didn't want either. So the best thing would be to form a band, go out on the roads and learn the hard way. He formed a new band called Zenta and signed with the record label ATA. Andy wanted to prove that he was worthy of a contract with Stigwood. He displayed his talents by writing the song Words and Music, which became a hit on the Australian charts. As 1974 gave way to 1975, the Bee Gees were ready for a new beginning. Their old friend Eric Clapton, then on the verge of a comeback of his own, suggested that the brothers try Miami's legendary Criteria Studios. With Erev Martin again producing, they started recording at Criteria. We were on our way back from the studio, and every time you leave Criteria, there's a bridge. And the, the bridge is rickety, and it makes a noise when you go over it. And every night, I'd hear the same thing. That and I'd hear it every night. And so one night, uh, we went over there, and the car must have been traveling at a certain speed, and the rhythm felt really right. And I just started singing along with it. And it just became, you know, the term jive talking came from that just sort of popped into my head as is what usually happens if I have an idea for a song it's not something I ask for it just comes and, and I, this was something and I, and I thought wait I gotta sing this tomorrow from Rob when I get home I sang the idea to them and we actually wrote the entire song that night The resulting album, Main Course, was a radical departure for the Bee Gees. Most of the record was funky, up-tempo solo. Resorting to an old trick, Stigwood sent the first single out to radio stations with a blank label, not listing the group's name. Jive Talking went to number one. When I first heard Jive Talking, I had no idea it was the Bee Gees. 
Everybody went, who? The Bee Gees broken heart Bee Gees? Are you kidding? And that changed our whole career. With main course, the Bee Gees had scored their first number one record in four years. Nights on Broadway, the second hit single from the main course album, introduced a key ingredient to the Bee Gees' new sound. just to most of the vocal tracks and usually you know at the end you know you have some ad libs or some kind of thing to take us away from the original melody and have some fun you know so Barry said I'll have a go I went out there on my own and I experimented and and I started answering like blame it all you know blame it all and they like, yes fine this is just what we were looking for okay let's do more of that blame it all on the night on The Bee Gees hit the road with their exciting new music. Bee Gees mania was taking root in America. But no one could have predicted what would happen next. In 1975, the Bee Gees made a startling comeback with an album produced by Arif Martin. But the brothers were distressed to learn that for contractual reasons, they would have to make the next album without him. But Martin told the Gibbs not to worry. They could do it on their own, and he was right. Seemingly overnight, the brothers' songwriting had evolved from orchestral pop to a blend of white soul, R&B, and dance music. Children of the World was an enormous success, and the single, You Should Be Dancing, rocketed to number one in the summer of 1976. I believe I owe it to my brothers who produced my records, my brother Barry, who helps me. You know, if I have trouble writing any song, he, he always put me in the right direction, and he's always steered my career. Andy was someone I could always talk to, and who always talked to me, uh, because both of us sort of had a sense of isolation in growing up. So um, we were extremely close, and that's why we ended up making records together. It just seemed like the natural way to go. After grooming Andy as a performer in Australia, Stigwood thought it was time for him to record his first album. Andy moved to Miami, Florida to record the new album. Barry produced Andy's recording session, penning Andy's first two singles. For so long, you and me been finding each other for so long. That was when it was, that was when he was at his best. That was when he was at his best at that age, wanting to be successful, not having the success, but having the hunger. The music was all, the music was everything. The album, Flowing Rivers, was released in 1977. In a flash, Andy achieved his dream of becoming a star. Flowing Rivers enjoyed great success. The album's first two singles, I Just Want to Be Your Everything and Love is Thicker Than Water, went to number one on the charts. But he had a charisma on stage. You know, something shone out of Andy. When you saw the video footage of them on TV shows, um, he had a stage presence. It was just a natural thing. He had a charm, no matter one-on-one -on -one or in front of 20,000 people at, at a venue. And when he performed, he commanded that audience. He had them in the palm of his hand, you know? With their younger brother's career successfully launched, the Bee Gees went to work on their next album. After a month of hard work, the brothers' creative flow was interrupted by a call from Robert Stigwood. He needed music for a little film he was producing. Stigwood had bought the movie rights to a New York Magazine article, Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night. Teen idol John Travolta was cast as the lead. We were getting songs ready for our new studio album, which would be the follow-up to Children of the World, and it was imperative that we got that right instead of just you know, stopping now and doing a few songs for a movie. Unless, of course, we knew it was going to be a huge film, which was no guarantee, of course. 
Stigwood called the Gibb brothers in France and told them about the film. You know, he told us about this guy who works in a paint shop on the other side of the bridge in Brooklyn, you know, and he blows his wages every Saturday night at a club and wins a dance competition. We thought, nice one, Rob. Those songs were actually written before the film was even mentioned to us. How Deep Is Your Love, If I Can't Have You, Night Fever, Staying Alive, More Than a Woman, uh, all written before we'd seen the film. And they played me some of the songs that they'd written for Saturday Night Fever. And I couldn't believe that they'd done this. I mean, the stuff was so good, fantastic. I thought it was written by somebody else. And I didn't tell them that. <laughs> In December, the first single from the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, How Deep Is Your Love, went to number one. Saturday Night Fever score was unique in taking the best of really funky black music and together with very tuneful white music and melding the two things together in a, in a style that was irresistible. When Stigwood heard the Bee Gees song Night Fever, he changed the name of the film from Saturday Night to Saturday Night Fever. We know how to do it. You know, even old men like me would get on the floor and move because you just couldn't stop it. Saturday Night Fever was released in December 1977. Unexpectedly, Stigwood's little movie became a cultural phenomenon. The film grossed $350 million at the box office, and the Fever double album sold over 30 million copies worldwide, making it one of the best-selling soundtracks ever. Staying Alive hit number one and remained there for the entire month of February, only to be replaced by Andy Gibbs' song, Love is Thicker Than Water, which was then replaced by Night Fever. If I Can't Have You, written by the Bee Gees and sung by Yvonne Elliman, became the fourth number one of the soundtrack, an unprecedented achievement. At one point in 1978, five singles written by the Bee Gees were in the top ten simultaneously. Well, with Saturday Night Fever, they became uh, one of the biggest groups on the planet, but also uh, people who really set a social agenda in terms of style, making very urban music that had a broad, broad social appeal. Um, to have that kind of success was very rare, and uh, again, we knew it was something that uh, probably only the Beatles had experienced. Well, we didn't know we were defining the culture. We were just still Barry Morris and Robin, wondering what the hell's going on. The Saturday Night Fever album remained at number one for 24 consecutive weeks. It was the most successful soundtrack of all time. The Bee Gees had become so dominant that in March of 1978, records written and produced by the brothers Gibb occupied five of the top ten spots on the Billboard Hot 100. No other songwriters can make that claim. In spite of the enormous success and impact of Saturday Night Fever, the soundtrack did not receive an Oscar nomination. This lack of acknowledgement by the film industry for their groundbreaking work was a disappointment. Frankie Valli and Samantha Sang also had number one hits that year with songs written by the brothers. Frankie Valley's Grease was the result of another soundtrack request from Stigwood to Barry. Well, how do you write a song called Grease? You know, and, and he actually said, well, Grease, da da da, Grease, da da da. You know, just do it. You know, so um, he was very dominating those days. I think the worst mistake we ever made was probably Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. 
The first blow to the Bee Gees image was when they starred with Peter Frampton in Robert Stigwood's film, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. For 11 years, Robert Stigwood's managerial advice had been nearly flawless. So when he approached them with the idea of turning a classic Beatles album into a movie, a movie in which they would star, it was irresistible. Stigwood was determined to maintain the momentum of Saturday Night Fever in Greece with another pop film and double album. But Sgt. Pepper's was a fiasco, a critical and commercial flop so big it threatened to wipe out the huge profits RSO had made on Fever in Greece. Worst of all, after so much success, it stuck the Bee Gees with a stigma they had shaken years before, second-rate Beatles. And everything was so disjointed in the story. We were, we were, we literally begged us at one point to, to be let to be let go from the film because we just didn't feel that we had any relevance to the film whatsoever. It was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the worst. It was we the best to, of times, but we had the to worst of films. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks into the film, I knew what it was. Robin and Morris and myself all went to Robert's house and said, please take us out of this film. Please take us out of this film. Oh, yes, we pulled it out. We wanted it out of this film. We said, this is going to kill us. There's no reason to make the movie. There's no reason to involve the Bee Gees in it. There's no reason for the Bee Gees to cover the Beatles' music. It seemed uh, a project done for Hollywood rather than musical or artistic reasons. In the wake of the Sgt. Pepper fiasco, the brothers had a falling out with Stigwood. They made an independent audit of RSO Records and discovered that they were owed royalties. They filed a very public $200 million lawsuit against him, claiming mismanagement and unfair enrichment. What we've learned is that if you take issue and if you have genuine arguments with the people that represent you and the people that are responsible for getting your records to the public, you're on really dangerous ground. The lawsuit was later settled out of court with public apologies from both sides. All the problems were settled, but the momentum had been lost. We'd lost our team. Once their work on Sgt. Pepper was completed, the Bee Gees returned to Miami to make their first album since Saturday Night Fever. It's incredibly difficult to sustain success of that sort because no sooner have you got one number one, okay, that's great, everybody lords you, but the pressure to create another one is twice as hard. And for them to achieve the run that they had is unique. Working again with producing partners Carl Richardson and Albie Galutin and their longtime band Dennis Bryan, Blue Weaver, and Alan Kendall, the Bee Gees recorded Spirits Having Flown, which became the most successful album of their career, selling nearly 15 million copies. Spirits Having Flown yielded another trio of number one. Nobody gets too much heaven anymore. It's as high as a mountain and harder to climb. Released in November of 1978, Too Much Heaven became their fourth straight number one single. In an unprecedented act of charity, the Bee Gees donated all royalties from the song to UNICEF, and working with Robert Stigwood encouraged other artists to do the same. To date, the collective efforts of everyone involved have raised over $10 million. Please welcome my younger brother, Andy Giff. Andy's meteoric rise in popularity continued. In 1978, he released Shadow Dancing, and the album was an instant hit. Andy's second album, Shadow Dancer, contained the single of the same name, which was his third consecutive US chart album. He was the first solo artist to have his first three singles go to number one in Billboard. I mean, you can't ask for better than that. Andy was just such a marketable commodity at that time. He had his own fan club. He had all sorts of merchandise produced. 
Uh, what's the thing you could then go and buy out? You could bubble gum, what's it, which had what's that, fold out poster or collector's cards, jigsaw, you had plastic guitars, you even had an Andy Gibb disco dancing doll. In 1978, Andy Gibb was considered one of the hottest eligible heartthrobs in Hollywood. He courted many of the most sought after celebrities of the day, including Susan George and Marie Osmond. After three years of hit making, Andy Gibb fell victim to the same pressures and temptations of first fame that had overwhelmed his brothers. First fame is um, a very dangerous thing. And you believe what you read about yourself, you believe what people say about you, you believe that you have something very special to say and that God's talking through you and the public need to know, you know. And um, so this happens to you when you become famous for the first time, especially at an international level. So I think he was, uh, I think it was a little crazy for him, you know, for a while. As quickly as he became an overnight sensation, Andy's initial confidence evaporated. He began to battle bouts of insecurity, questioning the legitimacy of his newfound success. I think he, he must have had it in his mind what it was going to be like but I don't think he knew how to deal with it once it happened. I think that Andy felt that he had something to prove, uh, to be a part of his family, but to find your own individuality uh, within it. I think that was difficult for Andy. I think he always wanted to be a part of them, yet he didn't quite feel a part of them. He wanted to be like us, he wanted to perform, he wanted to do all the things that we were doing, and, and somehow we never really became four. By the time that we were having some success, he was still a kid. And it just seemed to go on that way. I still think he thinks that he still had to prove himself to be as good as we were in many ways or to gain the same success. You know, I think there'll always be that kind of brotherly sibling type of rivalry. He always wanted to prove things on his own. He always wanted to prove himself without us, you know, helping him or, or him being part of BG. So much of his success, he felt, maybe had to do with Barry's help and his brother's help. On some level, internally, he thought that maybe it wasn't as much about him as it was about the fact that his brothers had influenced his success. While Andy was approaching superstar status and selling millions of records, he did his best to hide his drug problems. He could do anything, anything at all that he could put his mind to. The only thing he couldn't do was stop drinking or stop taking drugs. I, I talked to him outside on the balcony. Uh, saying, you know, this is really a nice house, Andy. There's a nice car out there, that Porsche. Really nice. You're not going to keep all this, you know. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you do what you're doing. This stuff will vanish. All this stuff will go. Your career will go out the window, everything. And he said, I know, I know. I've got, I know what I have to do. But Andy couldn't be helped. You know, you help us. You help us because that person really has to cure themselves. It doesn't, other people can't do it. You know, you have to decide that you, have, that you want to be clean, you want to be straight. He was a great artist, out of control, and his personality and his emotions just couldn't deal with what was going on around him and the, and the success that he had. When he was, you know, under the influence, that wasn't him at all, that was somebody else who took over. I think the success worked against him, having it so early. Tragedy, you know, right out of the chute was just an absolute mammoth hit uh, around the planet. And uh, the record itself, artistically, it's a superb record. And it's a spooky, interesting record, too. Tragedy went to number one, as did the follow-up, Love You Inside Out. The Bee Gees were at the top of the music business. A decade after they had fallen from favor, they had regained their old success ten times over.
the Bee Gees had now written and produced six straight number one records. No other group has ever accomplished such a feat. And once they'd done that, then I think even the dimmest rock critic realized that they actually had some ability and they were going to be around for a long time. In June of 1979, the brothers embarked on their first concert tour since the outbreak of fever. Oh, it was fantastic, the whole experience. Of course, I mean, I, I don't like things in a mania stage. I like consistent, respectable success because then it's more manageable. But when things are, when they get to a point like fever had, it was kind of out of control a bit. So we've got to, got to get a message, message to you. you. Two, three, four, to love somebody. This is boring. Yeah. I mean, there's all yeah, this, but it's not the last one. It works in South Pacific. Ooh. He's back. Night's on Broadway. No. Out. Come on. <laughs> How did you people get back here? Come on. Come on. Sorry. Excuse me. Move your way. Are you going to pass? I'm sorry. You can't come here. Get him out. You can't come here. This is a private session. But to go on stage and see the audience, and because I love, that's the only way you can say thank you, really, is by going on stage live. <laughs> The emotional highlight of the Spirits tour came when brother Andy joined them on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, our brother Andy! How oh, wonderful. And he was, he was at his height too. He'd made it as well. And so it was a wonderful feeling. Now those four brothers. Andy Gibb had always wanted to be a Bee Gee. But because he was so much younger than his brothers, when he began his career in music, it was as a solo artist. Andy was a chip off the old block. He was a young Bee Gee. And the first three songs that he, he released went to number one in America, which were extraordinary. Uh, he idolized Barry particularly. I, was, I would say that we were as much like twins as Morris and Robin. And we were very much alike. We looked alike. We had the same birthmarks. The difference was is that I was taller than Andy. But the way we felt and the way we thought was almost identical. In 1977, Barry had taken 19-year-old Andy into the studio and produced a string of enormously popular singles. Andy's success, coupled with their own, brought the brothers Gibb to new career heights. It was the best thing you can hope for, all the brothers, you know, enjoying themselves and being successful and working together. During the drum break, he actually said to me, can you believe this craziness? Can you believe it all? And I thought, no. It's incredible, isn't it? And he said, oh, man, I'll never forget this. As 1979 came to a close, the brothers Gibb were ready to take a break. During the next decade, the Bee Gees would write some of their biggest hits ever, as well as face some of their biggest individual challenges. By the summer of 1979, the fruits of their fever labors had brought the Bee Gees five Grammys, the Spirits having flown album and tour were racking up big numbers. And their star was rising over Hollywood Boulevard. But a resentment was simmering among rock fans toward the dance music that had dominated the airwaves and the culture. On July 13, 1979, between games of a baseball doubleheader, at Comiskey Park in Chicago. A local radio station staged a disco demolition promotion. There had to be a backlash. And it wasn't just because it was a backlash towards us. We happened to have just been the target. Oh, there were blackouts from American radio. Don't forget to tune in this weekend. We're having a Bee Gees free weekend, you know? Now, can you remember that ever being said by, about any other artist? No. Quite unique. That's scary stuff. Where art meets commerce sometimes, commerce doesn't know when to quit. And exposure beyond a certain point really isn't great. It got to that point, particularly domestically uh, with the Bee Gees, because in the United States it's such a social laboratory and we will take on everything. 
In other countries and other cultures, people pick and choose. We tend to sit down at the table like it's a Viking wedding and stay there until everything's gone. It didn't stop them from making both great records and in some cases absolutely incredible records. But the United States, big a market as it is, as diverse a culture as it is, it needed a rest from the Bee Gees. In 1979, Barry produced Andy's third album, After Dark. Let's do it again. You know, let's go in the studio again. During the recording of it, Andy's drug use began to catch up with him. Between the Shadow Dancing album in 78 and After Dark in 1980, there seemed to be this, this void which was 1979. There was obviously something going on there. I think there was, there was obviously some, some abuse going on there. He did his best to hide his drug problems. He kept his habit a secret from his family and friends, and he habitually missed recording sessions. His voice was weakened as a result of cocaine abuse. And this is where Andy's voice started to decline sort of during that period. So consequently, a lot of what you're hearing on the After Dark album is Barry. By now, Robert Stigwood realized Andy had a drug problem. He desperately tried to help. So you try to uh, protect them. You try to protect their finances so they can't have access to so much money they can just throw it away. You're trying to help them, but you then become the enemy. And you lose that sympathy that you shared. Just two years after they were the best-selling act in the world, the Bee Gees decided they had to step out of the spotlight. Even though the musical landscape was changing, the brothers Gibb refused to be silenced. If radio wouldn't play their records, then they would have to find a new voice. The Brothers Gibb wrote and produced entire albums for other artists, including Guilty for Barbra Streisand. Working with one of the greatest female vocalists of the 20th century, Barry and his production team took songs written by the brothers and produced Guilty, which would become one of the most successful albums of Barbara Streisand's career. Following his Grammy-winning association with Streisand, Barry went on to produce a series of projects that would bring enormous success to other artists. Among them was Dionne Warwick, who had a top ten hit with the brothers Heartbreaker. Why do you have to be a heartbreaker when I was being what you want me to be? Suddenly everything I ever wanted has passed me by. In 1983, the Bee Gees wrote an R&B song for Diana Ross, but it was Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton who made it one of the biggest-selling singles in the history of country music. When Islands in the Stream hit number one, it meant that, along with the eight Bee Gees chart toppers made with his brothers, Barry had now produced a total of 14 number one records, more than any other British producer except for the Beatles mentor, Sir George Martin. The distinctive sound of the Bee Gees, obviously, is the quality of their song, um, but also, that, I mean, Barry's high voice has something to do with it, too, melding in with whatever singer he's working with, Streisand or whoever it is, um, that gives a unique sound, and uh, there's no one else who does it. Simple as that. It was a bizarre situation. People didn't want to admit they liked the Bee Gees, yet records written by the Bee Gees, produced by the Bee Gees, and sounding like the Bee Gees kept becoming bestsellers. The 
brothers were busily creating hits for other artists, but their own recordings were not as successful. In 1981, the Bee Gees put out their last album for RSO Records, Living Eyes, an attempt to move away from their disco falsetto style. In the midst of the backlash and lawsuits, the album went unnoticed. Neither 1981's Living Eyes album nor Stayin' Alive, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever, produced a top 10 single. I mean, there were very turbulent times. Meanwhile, younger brother Andy's career was in desperate times. After his initial success in the late 70s, Andy had developed a terrible drug problem. Sales for Andy's After Dark didn't fare as well as the previous two. With disco waning, his record sales dropping, and his brothers too busy producing other acts. When Andy's recording career went into decline, he was obviously looking for working in other, in other areas, and he started getting jobs on stage. Andy focused on creating a television identity for himself. He was hired to co-host the weekly TV series Solid Gold. The show featured the top billboard hits of the week and was an ideal vehicle for Andy's talents. Mr. Andy Gibb. Andy Gibb was making an appearance on the John Davidson show on 6th of January 1981 and the researchers on that show had come across an interview that he'd done with the magazine in the past where Andy mentioned his two dream girls. One of them was Victoria Principal who was in the incredibly successful TV series Dallas at the time. Victoria was booked into the studio opposite doing The Tonight Show. So the topic of Andy's favorite ladies was brought up and Victoria sneaked into the studio to Andy's utter amazement and just watching the clip you can just see it went through he is just totally gobsmacked and it is pretty much love at first sight when did you first realize that this was the reason why you watched Dallas from the very beginning the first time you saw her from the very first time I saw her, yes. Yeah? yeah. Mm, thank you. No, I've I really I've never missed an episode. <laughs> yes. I don't really care who shot they are. <laughs> they had said some very nice things about me. And I had jotted off a note uh, to him saying that I really appreciated the nice things he had said. And in my usual fashion, had not mailed it. And it remained in my purse with a stamp on it. So I thought I'd just bring it over because I hadn't oh. mailed it. <laughs> Well, it's going to sound rather dramatic, but Andy was simply the nicest person I've ever known. I think his, uh, his relationship with Victoria Principal was absolutely beautiful. It was everything he dreamed of. And that's the only important thing here. It's not what I think or anybody else thinks. Andy thought the world of her. Andy and Victoria quickly became the it couple of Hollywood, and their relationship received a lot of publicity. Andy was not only starting a new romance, but also a new career path outside the world of pop music. My next guest is not only a beautiful and talented actress, but she's a very special friend. Whenever I want you, all I have to do is dream. To capitalize on their popularity, they teamed up and released a single, All I Have to Do, in August of 1981. His third album was barely in the top 25 and only on the uh, American chart for uh, 15 weeks. He was just such a good guest, always on the face of it. The kid next door, as it were, sort of good looking guy. He was the first solo artist to take his first three singles to the top of the American charts. Nobody else can say that. Andy was the one that did that. Andy's future in show business brightened further when he drew interest from theater producers mounting an L.A. production of the hit Broadway musical Pirates of Penzance, co-starring Pam Dauber. Andy was truly one of the sweetest souls. He was so unassuming. As Andy juggled the pressures of starring on stage, 
being in a hit TV show and maintaining a high-profile romance, he continued to abuse drugs. He wanted to quit, and he would say he would quit, but he couldn't seem to quit. He was in pain over his drug problem. People are always patting you on the butt, you know, in those times, you know, handing you a joint, putting a spoon under your nose. Hey, I did coke with Andy Gibb. You know what I mean? There's always somebody that wants to be there just because you're famous, not because you're you, not because you earned it. He had a, a, a very weak um, personality in saying no to these things and didn't really see any harm. He felt good doing it, so he didn't think he was doing him any harm. When he was, you know, under the influence, that wasn't him at all. That was somebody else took over. But the next day, he'd be back apologizing to everybody. He didn't know what he'd done, but he would be sorry. He knew he'd done something wrong, and he'd be sorry. Andy faced personal issues as well. Victoria Principal finally gave Andy an ultimatum. I asked him either to choose me or to choose drugs. Andy may have wanted to be with Victoria, but eventually the drugs won out. And uh, I know with all his heart he wanted to choose me. He chose drugs. The couple broke up in March 1982. Living without you, living alone, this empty house seems so cold. What hurt me was that she didn't seem to go through any pain at all. And I felt a bit strange being the man, feeling the pain and the weakness. And uh, it really was hell for me. It really was. I had a nervous breakdown. It put me in an incredible position of, of a, a terrible dilemma. Because to speak out on my own behalf and to reveal the fact that the problem had been ongoing and that was the reason for the breakup would have been to add to the already tremendous burden that Andy was carrying. And so I chose to remain silent. The breakup of Andy and Victoria became fodder for the tabloids and talk shows. Their relationship was so public and so scrutinized and so talked about. And when they were dating, it was fine. But when the split happened, it was really painful for him to have to go through that in the media. Andy continued to diversify his career by making guest appearances on TV shows. Andy went on The Tonight Show with Joan Rivers, hoping to talk about his career but was forced to discuss Victoria instead. How did you know when you were breaking up? Well, we just started to argue an awful lot at the end. It's and, awful. Uh, I don't want to talk about all this. Come on. But then you went to... I, and I don't want to discuss it anymore either. I was pretty bad for quite a while. I was very, very depressed. And I, I missed her for quite a while, of course. Yeah, because you were in love. That's right. And uh, obviously, at the end, it wasn't mutual. Things were spiraling downhill for Andy. In March 1982, his contract with RSO was not renewed based on poor record sales. I tried and tried and uh, absolutely broke my heart. He was also let go from Pirates of Penzance and Solid Gold because of his recurring absences. That's what he would threaten them. He wasn't going to go on stage if they didn't get him some. And of course, everybody running around flustered trying to find some. I don't know where they got it from, but somebody always managed to get it for him. Andy's career and personal life hit rock bottom. Andy spoke publicly about his setbacks with the hopes of reviving his career and reputation. I have been to hell and back, I suppose, literally. You, you did, in fact, have a nervous breakdown, is that correct? Yes, I had a very, very bad nervous breakdown, actually. I want to tell a story now. I turned to drugs for a month. I did quite an, an awful lot of cocaine, which I no longer do. I gave up everything. I, I started missing tapings of Solid Gold. I would not turn up for tapings. Very bad boy. I didn't care. I didn't care about people. I didn't care about life. I thought so much of the girl, and I still do. It just, I just fell apart. Totally off yeah. the drugs. Totally off drugs. And I think it's very important for my fans who have been with me since I started in the business at 18 to know exactly what has happened to me, to know that they, can, so they should not do this to themselves. I think it's very vital. Still, Andy's solid gold appearances caught the eye of agent Jeff Widges, who felt Andy still had star appeal. I got to know Andy very well. He was very charismatic, very talented. Andy and his team wanted to utilize his singing talents and his ability to charm live audiences. So what we did is we developed a solo act of his and had him tour. 
Andy found new life performing on stage again. This is a new audience for you, a much totally older new. audience. Totally new. Now, how does that affect uh, what you do out there on stage? Well, unlike concerts, you have to be a little bit more intimate. Audiences loved Andy, but that didn't keep his insecurities at bay. So it's not true that there is still a drug problem? No drug problem. And there is no, no drug way. problem today? I only had one drug problem in my life, and I'm never going to go through that again. In 1986, following a series of solo projects, the brothers came to the realization that the industry was more interested in them as the Bee Gees than as individuals. After a five-year break, they decided to come back together as a group. The Bee Gees' third career had begun. You Win Again was an enormous international hit, reaching number one in England. Yet neither the single nor the ESP album made the top 40 in the United States. This disappointment would soon be overshadowed by an unspeakable tragedy that would make chart positions meaningless. In 1987, the Bee Gees were in the midst of their third major comeback. You Win Again had gone to number one in England, making them the first group ever to top the British charts in three straight decades. But this achievement was not one they could cherish. By April 1985, with his career opportunities dwindling and his finances taking a plunge, Andy decided to get help by checking himself into the Betty Ford Center for treatment of his drug addiction. I think I finally did have a conversation with his mom where she said that he was in the hospital and that he um, had made a decision that he was going to check himself into Betty Ford. The doctor felt it was very important for him to be around people who he cared about and that he felt really safe with. Andy's days at Betty Ford were promising to his family and friends. He began playing his guitar again. He was writing songs, and he was hoping to recapture his recording career. He said, you know what, Marie? He said, I'm, I, I'm a member of AA, and I love it. I know I'm an alcoholic, and I, and I know it's a problem, and I know I can beat it. He says, I can do it. He goes, I'm off drugs. I'm clean. He says, it feels so great. I'm so happy. You've had a long-standing battle with drugs. You're doing okay now, but tell us a little bit about that. You know, it was. A few people in the business knew about it for quite a few years, and I tried to keep it secret. I was with cocaine. And it got to the point where, I mean, my family, of course, for many years have been very, very concerned, very concerned, because it got to the point of danger. Andy left Betty Ford intending to stay drug-free. His family and friends decided to give him space and time to adjust to a life without drugs. His family even went so far as to move him from the old house that he was in into a new place so that he wouldn't walk back into an environment that had old memories. Unfortunately, you know, he got out and everybody was like, let's give him a little time to get settled, go to his meetings. And within a couple of days, he was already out again. You know, he lost his sobriety. As Andy's life continued to spiral downward, the Gibb family would again try to rescue their wayward son. By the late 1980s, Andy Gibb's world was in complete turmoil. In 1985, he earned just over $24,000, and in 1986, his income dropped all the way down to just under $8,000. I think that was a dashing blow to Andy. I think it was a, a, a crippling blow to him. I, I don't think he survived that. I think he was, there was, uh, he was um, embarrassed by it. In 1987, the Gibb family united to help Andy resuscitate his ailing career. During this time, he renewed his close relationship with his brother Barry, playing tennis with him on a regular basis. While the family was pleased to see Andy getting back on track, Barry sensed that something was still amiss. We would play tennis and we'd play five or six sets and he'd get very sort of flushed and red and I didn't know why, you know, and, and 
what he wasn't telling me was that he really shouldn't be doing this. Andy was experiencing shortness of breath and chest pains. Health issues aside, Andy decided to give writing music another try. He recorded four original songs with his brothers at their studios in Miami, Florida. The fact that we'd done it together in the first place was um, what, what brought him back, is that, you know, let's do it again. You know, let's go in the studio again, and, and this time, you know, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll keep my grip, and I'll be, and I'll, and I'll hold on. I won't slip again. You know. During those sessions, Andy began to recapture the spark of his earlier hit albums. It seemed that he was finally rounding back into form. We used the BG Studio Middle Ear in Miami to record the demos for four songs. Steady and your rage Bring me to my knees again I'm too young to die I'm too young to die On the strength of these, Island Records signed him and he came over to Britain in January of 1988. He stayed in the, in the little chancery next to Robin's main residence in Oxfordshire. Andy decided to give writing music another try. Something went wrong and he just suddenly became extremely reclusive. Um, he, he couldn't write. He got a block and he couldn't write. And that upset him. That upset him very, very much. I had to keep reassuring him that, you know, of his talent and, you know, and build up his confidence. It actually affected his mind that he had to really start again. I don't think he could feel like he wanted to start again. And he wouldn't come out of his college for days. He'd miss appointments. Um, he, missed, he wouldn't take phone calls. There was something going on, and I couldn't figure out what was going on in his head. And uh, I got on to Robin, and Robin said, Don't come, Mom. You're babying him too much. He's fine. But I was on that plane the next day because I knew something was wrong. Yeah. Walking in and out and saying, I might as well be dead. There's nothing going on. This was because there was nobody there, you see. He didn't need, really need to be away from his family, and we didn't really want him away from us. And uh, I think he went into a decline because of that. He seemed to be drinking, what sort of from evidence that we've heard. He was drinking again. He was drinking, definitely. He was getting those little tiny bottles. He was ringing the little liquor store in Tame at 2 o'clock in the morning for a bottle of vodka. These people were dead. And uh, we thought this was terrible. I called him up, but Robin said he was drunk. And I, I said, I was sod him then. And I put the phone down. And I never spoke to him. So I never forgave myself for that for a long time. I thought, oh, I should have spoken to him, you know. But the last thing that happened between me and Andy was an argument, which is devastating for me, because I had to live with that all my life. And there was a phone call between him and me and I was sort of saying, you know, you've really got to get your act together and this is no good. And instead of being a gentle about it, I was angry. And because someone had said to me at some point, you know, tough love is the answer, you know. So uh, for me, it wasn't, you know, because that was the last conversation we had. So, um, so that, that's my regrets. That's what I live with. It was to the point where he couldn't even stand up. He couldn't be kept falling down. Um, he, was, he smashed his face against the wall, lost all his teeth. Oh, it was just a mess. I mean, I could go on and on. But, uh, and um, my mother had to be there to see if it was a nightmare for her. He didn't even, he wasn't even aware of his existence anymore. Robin took care of him, but um, he was clean. He hadn't been doing drugs for quite a while, but unfortunately, he hadn't been able to kick the booze, and uh, that had weakened his heart. On March 7th, just two days after his 30th birthday, he checked into the John Radcliffe Hospital in England with brutal chest pains. I said, I'll stay with him. You know, I thought, well, bring me the paper, I'll stay here all night. But she wouldn't let me. She said, well, you know, you better go because he'll sleep all night now. We've given him something to sleep. And he was, he was fast asleep. So I had to go, and I said, I'll be back in the morning. The next morning, the doctor went in and said, do you mind if we take some more blood, Andy? And he said, no. And by the time the doctor turned around and went, he gave one big sigh and he was gone. Singer Andy Gibb, who along with his three older brothers became a prominent part of the music world in the 1970s, died today in a hospital in England. 
On March 10, 1988, only days after his 30th birthday, Andy Gibb, the Bee Gees' little brother, died. Maybe I don't want to know the reason why But lately you don't talk to me Darling, I can't see me in your eyes I had a dream once that he, he would die, and it scared the hell out of me. And I remember the morning when I got the news um, that will always burn in my brain and in my heart. He was a great kid. I think it was hard on all of them and their wives. They all took it very hard. Every one of us, all of us, we all took it very hard. To me, it, it was just shocking that he, uh, a guy so young had to leave so early. Yeah. If once you lose someone of your own blood, I think it changes you radically. I think, I think the spiritual lesson and the soul growth, I think, is the term. Whatever they say, whatever, whatever the term is, I think, I think you, you grow deeply inside and you never really forget. The loneliest feeling I felt was we were driving away and I looked at the wall and I just saw it. There was no one else there, just his coffin lying there against the wall. And I felt like he'd been abandoned. And we all wanted to go back and just stay with him. Well, it makes you treasure everybody more. It's, um, it's a kind of reminder of your mortality, isn't it? When he died, it was nothing to do with drugs at all. But the damage had been done through the drugs, you see, in the first place. The media began to broadcast false reports that Andy had died from a drug overdose. In fact, he actually died from myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart. I think a lot of the family were angry that Andy's death was being portrayed as drug abuse, and it wasn't. Andy was buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Hollywood Hills, California. It was just all these people that just loved him so much. I just remember, like, the look on Olivia Newton-John's face, who just adored him. And it's just one of those moments where you think, this isn't right. This is not the way it's supposed to be, because he had so much more life to live. One mustn't think he was just some dope who let himself go on drugs. Uh, so many artists have been through that drug scene, and I know that so well. It was his weak heart was the key, that, that he couldn't afford the stress of the lifestyle that he had adopted. The sad thing is, is that he died from a heart ailment, because Andy really had the biggest heart. Even though it's been quite a while since Andy has passed away, he's still in many, many people's hearts. As you can see, if you do searches on the internet and things like that, he touched so many people when he was here. His sensitivity came across and his passion came across when he was performing. And I think that's what was part of his charm and part of his special talent that he had. Why did you have to leave so soon? So if there's anything to be learned, is that nothing lasts at all. The week after, we thought, maybe if we go back to work, we can, uh, you know, get recentered or something. And I had to... I was playing the strings, and it was very beautiful. Barry and Robbie just started crying. Mike just started crying. I can't play anymore. We went home, and about a month later, we came back in, and then we did uh, Wish You Were Here, Randy. And that was difficult to sing, very difficult. But we wanted to sing it, we wanted to do it. I lost everything in losing you. I, I wish you were here, trying these tears I cry. They were good times, and I wish you were here. I don't think he liked the world that was going on out there, so he kind of constructed his own, which in the end, when he did have to deal with the real world, it was kind of hard for him. This it will get easier, but he doesn't. I regret that we didn't 
spend more time, that we were always too busy. Yeah. And of course you always have that after somebody's gone. You always feel um, remorse because you could have given them more time. Um, you could have, there were things you could have said you didn't say, and um, vice versa. Well, I hope people remember how he's, how he, remember particularly his kindness, because he helped a lot of people. He just couldn't help himself. I had to live for many years with the awareness it wasn't if Andy would die, it would be when Andy would die. I felt like he died of a broken heart, which is so sad. But I felt like he, he just checked out. He couldn't do it anymore. But Andy had any, everything. He had fame and popularity and the money and anything you could want, but he was still empty. Andy could have been a megastar. You know, I just, it was just there. It is terribly hard to cope with. He got devoured because he was the current celebrity. Several years after Andy died, I had a dream. And in that dream, Andy came to me knowing that I was haunted by this. And we sat down and we had the talk that, that I certainly wanted to have and that we probably needed to have. And I thought it was so like Andy. Even after his death, to find a way to bring me solace. This was not an angry, um, troublesome person. This was someone that was very well centered, um, loved his family. And I think it's that side that we don't remember of artists usually. He was a very, very beautiful person. And I think that's what we should remember. The brothers pour their broken hearts into a new album. One. The title song was a worldwide success. Baby, I tell you something. something. Baby, you and I should be you one. And I should be one. The Bee Gees embarked on their first U.S. tour in a decade, followed by the album High Civilization, then a European tour. What the public didn't know was that Barry, the rock-solid older brother, was battling a serious back problem. It was literally agony doing Europe, and uh, after that I couldn't, I couldn't walk. And when you sing falsetto, <laughs> it's a hell of a high range to go to, you need your back. And it's agony when you do it, because you... Ugh. You know, you feel it before you've even taken half a breath. So Barry was going through all that stuff. And I don't know how he did it, but he didn't want to do a bad show. If you reach the point where you ask for back surgery, um, you're in trouble. And there was no recourse because, uh, you know, I was basically a cripple at that point if I didn't have back surgery. Are you ready? You guys ready? In the early oh. 90s, Barry wasn't the only brother living in constant pain. Morris was dealing with his own addiction to alcohol. It affected families, mum, dad, everybody as Andy's did. You know, it was the same kind of thing, but my drug of choice was alcohol. And up to the age of 25, I was fine. After 25, something happened. And I was getting sicker and sicker. It really, it really hit me in the 80s. Yeah. Andy's death hit me very hard, um, as all of us. And I relapsed shortly after it, but for a couple of days, and then I got back in the program again. Morris's social drinking had turned into full-blown alcoholism. He was finding it more and more difficult to fulfill his responsibilities as a brother a father and husband for me it's it's an ongoing battle it's not you don't really win it's something if I'm an alcoholic I'm an alcoholic for the rest of my life since I've been in my recovery program it's changed my life my health my wife my kids my career In 1993, the Bee Gees made their 22nd studio album, Size Isn't Everything. Even though they had racked up every imaginable sales and chart achievement and produced a remarkable body of work, the respect of the music industry, particularly in America, had eluded them. That was about to change. In 1993, the Bee Gees released one of their strongest post-fever albums, Size Isn't Everything, 
featuring UK top 40 hits, Paying the Price of Love, and the epic ballad, For Whom the Bell Tolls. In 1994, the Bee Gees were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Two years later, as they prepared to celebrate the 30th anniversary of their first international hit, the unexpected happened. The music industry and the media began to reevaluate the Bee Gees' place in rock history. It's a colossal honor for me to present this award to a group who've been going for 30 years. To put that in perspective, our newcomers here tonight will have to keep going to the year 2027 to equal the achievements of the Brothers Gibb. Having the word British stamped on it is, uh, we always wanted to be recognized by, our, by the country we were born in. And to have that is wonderful. The attention that the Bee Gees got in the late 90s was, uh, Really, really long overdue. Robert Stigwood, as the greatest showman in the world, if you don't accept this award alongside us tonight, then we will not accept it either. But I'm so uh, proud of my lads, because I thought it was uh, overdue recognition for them. They've come back so often, they haven't been away, but if, if it could be said that they had a critical comeback, it was that night, I think, that, that, that kicked it into motion and the industry had finally realized that they were world beaters up there were the best please stand and welcome barry robin morskid the bgs <laughs> i don't think i've ever seen the bgs as emotional or as proud as when they heard that they were being elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But not only getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but being inducted by Brian Wilson, to me, was a knockout. That blew my night. Come on. We <laughs> we should be speechless, but we're not. With all the Grammys and all the American <laughs> Music Awards and all the Brit Awards, the idea of being in a small group of great artists was overwhelming to them. Tonight, I think we've come home, and we thank you very much for this honor. Almost without their knowing, these characters become legends, icons. And this is absolutely fitting. The Bee Gees are in that state now. And uh, if they're not careful, they go on being even more famous than they are already. The Bee Gees were grateful for the recognition, but they weren't looking back. The brothers were determined to create new music that would prove they were still a vital force. Alone was a hit, but Barry's physical problems made it impossible for the Bee Gees to mount a major tour. So they invented a new way of bringing their music to millions of fans around the world. The idea was to try to create an event that allowed the Bee Gees to perform in a way that everyone who wanted to see them could. And we came up with a concept called One Night Only. And for one night, anyone in the country could come see the Bee Gees or see it on television. Right now, we feel more comfortable doing just special event shows, almost like the three tenors do, you know? But uh, there's three of us anyway, and we can sing pretty high. Nobody gets too much.
much heaven no more It's much harder to come back I'm waiting in line over the next two years, the Bee Gees took one night only around the world, performing one concert on each continent to standing room only crowds. It became a pay-per-view event, a television special, and a CD that sold over five million copies. As the 20th century came to a close, it seemed the Bee Gees had once again conquered the world. But there was still one unique challenge ahead. In the year 2000, the Bee Gees went to work on a new album. Determined to once again reinvent their sound, they gave a contemporary twist to their musical roots. I've seen this story, I read it over once or twice. I said that you say a little bit of bad advice. This is where I came in. It's, I guess it's, it's our way of saying that things, nothing ever really changes. It's very honest and it reflects our feelings about everything that's happened to us in the past 30 years. We wanted that live feel, particularly on the opening track, and, and we just wanted to rock a bit more. But this is where I came in, is the harmony thing. We just wanted us, the three of us around one mic, singing the harmony on this song. This is kind of a lot of elements of what we're doing on the new album that we used to do a long time ago. There's an old kind of ingredients to it that we used to do, and it's kind of a come full circle. It's real instruments, real voices, real musicians, and it's great lyrics and melodies that I think is gonna catch people emotionally in a way that music used to. This is just where I came in The success of the Bee Gees is unparalleled. A five-decade-long career, well over 100 million records sold worldwide. And with nearly 1,000 compositions to their credit, the brothers Gibb are one of the most successful songwriting teams ever. Hundreds of artists have recorded their songs, and everybody has a favorite. My all-time favorite Bee Gees songs, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, which do you pick out of all that lot, you know? <laughs> Absolutely impossible question. This is the danger zone. This is where I came in. They don't know what they do. Forgive them all their sins. They know they cannot take away what you have given me. Undoubtedly, the Bee Gees will be looked back upon as being a very important part of the 20th century. Unique in respect of their musical contribution in writing, performing, and producing. They were, and still are, an incredible group. Bee Gees are, deserve to be up there as songwriters with Dylan, Lennon McCartney, Pete Townsend, Ray Davies, Selton. Bee Gees are as good as that lot. To me, were the still three kids from Manchester who wanted to be famous and just wanted to make music. I think the secret of what we feel is that we never lost the enthusiasm for what we do when we were little kids. It's still there, the sense of wonder. Uh, and sometimes you get a little bit phased and a little bit tired. Uh, but then, you know, you wake up one morning and you say, let's go back in the studio. We may never see uh, a Bee Gees again. We may never see a, a band prevail in every uh, popular sense across five decades. I hope and pray that the music lasts, you know, because to me, that's immortality. That's immortality.
The Bee Gees truly are the first family of pop music.